There's a light case, wonderful light case and that Dr. James McCabe and team is going to do for us. Yes, I'm sir. waiting for my co-moderator, uh, yeah. Dr. Gorab Ailawari, who I'm sure is on his way here. We have a great panel. Uh, we have Dr. Webb, oh. Dr. Didi Wang, Dr. Suzanne Baron, and Dr. Jo Joao Cavalcanti as uh, panelists. Um, Dr. McCabe, can you hear us? Hey, I can. Good, good afternoon, Boston time. <laughs> Okay, good morning, I guess, for you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. Why don't you introduce your team here, and um, and then we can start with the case. Oh, my co-moderator just arrived. Good thank morning. you. Oh, just All right. Good morning for them, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. thank you for waking up early and uh, prepare this case oh. for us. So please introduce your team. Absolutely. So we've got Dr. Burkhart Mackinson, who's going to be our imager today, Dr. Gabriel Aldea, who's my colleague on CT surgery, Dr. Christine Chung from Interventional Cardiology, Dr. Dave Elison, our fellow, we've got Alyssa, we've got Kai in nursing, we've got Dr. Ping Ping Song on anesthesia in the back, Nitya, CRNA. Um, we, we put together the best possible team we could we could find here to, to give put on a show for you. Uh, Thank you very much. Mara? Yes? I think we have to switch cities. It's great to see the background of the operating cath lab in Minneapolis, but we are. We always enjoy learning from Paul, but I think we need a University of Washington transmission. <laughs> Switch cities. I see Paul's using ice. Yeah. Okay. Can, can Paul hear us if we talk to him? Can we <laughs> talk to Minnesota too? Yeah. There you are. All right. Hey, Hi, now Paul. we see you. Good pickup. <laughs> um, people pick up. often confuse uh, me and, and Paul Saraja. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Good pickup, Joao. <laughs> okay. We're ready. Yeah, you want to tell now us we, about the case? We can see you now. Okay, great. We're glad to be here. Um, all right, Dr. Ellison's going to kick off the case presentation and uh, hope, make sure we can make, let us know if you can see the slides. We can. Yes. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, our patient today is a 68-year-old diabetic female with a history of chronic kidney disease, baseline creatinine about 2.3, with non-oxygen-dependent COPD, whose cardiac history begins uh, in 2001 when she had a cabbage. Her lima remains patent, but her grafts have subsequently occluded, and she's had several prior PCIs. At the time, uh, unbeknownst to the patient as well as her referring cardiologist, she had an annuloplasty ring placed on the mitral valve. Uh, the records from that time have since been purged, and so the size and type of the ring is unknown. She did well for a period of time. She had a pacemaker placed in 2016. Uh, sometime thereafter, she developed uh, recurrent uh, NYHA class 3 symptoms and was noted to have severe symptomatic mixed mitral valve disease. She subsequently underwent a mitral clip procedure in December of last year with placement of a single clip to the A3-P3 scallops. Uh, unfortunately, following that procedure, she actually felt worse uh, and was referred to a surgeon at that institution for consideration of mitral valve replacement. However, she was deemed not an operative candidate due to her comorbidities as well as the finding of a porcelain aorta. And she was actually at that time referred to hospice uh, however, sought a second opinion at our institution. Uh, she was evaluated by our surgical group as well and felt not to be a operative candidate for the same reasons. And we were undergoing an expedited evaluation for transcatheter mitral valve. However, uh, she progressed to NYHA class four symptoms and was admitted to our CCU on Wednesday of this week. I would note that her STS score is high with a predicted STS mortality of 10.3%. Uh, next slide. This is her TEE image, 2D, showing severe posteriorly directed uh, MR. Her LVEF estimate on this study was 35 to 40% with a mean transvalvular gradient of five at a heart rate of 65. Next slide. These are 3D reconstructions on the left. It's somewhat difficult to visualize, but you can see that there is a clip placed very uh, commissural into the medial commissure. Uh, and subsequently there was significant residual MR centrally, just uh, lateral to the existing clip. I would draw your attention to a small uh, orifice remaining in the medial commissure, which we can discuss the relevance of that as we move forward with the case. Next slide. 
On CT, uh, we wanted to highlight three aspects of this patient's mitral valve anatomy. One is that she does have a posterior annuloplasty ring. Based on the shape, we think it is likely a 180 Cosgrove ring. Again, don't have definitive records in that regard. There is a medial clip, which is an NTW, and some significant posterior MAC around the ring. The valve area estimate is 737 millimeters squared, and the BICOM distance is 33 millimeters, excluding the clip. However, when we make measurements from the clip to the ring, it ranges from around 22 to 23 millimeters. Uh, in the AP dimension, we're looking at about 25 to 26 millimeters. Next slide. There are no concerns for uh, LVOT obstruction in this case, as her estimated neo-LVOT is 345 millimeters squared, and we have no plans for septal modification or lampoon. Next slide. Christine, why don't you uh, sum up for us and, and talk a little bit about the next uh, slide. Yeah, so in summary, we have a 68-year-old woman who is inoperable due to multiple medical comorbidities as well as a porcelain aorta. Despite our expediting her treatment with uh, TMVR, she uh, developed progressive heart failure and ended up in our CCU a few days prior to the planned admission. So at this point, we have a patient with symptomatic severe MR. She also has mild to moderate MS. We have the presence of a incomplete posterior annuloplasty ring. Because it's been in there for about 20 years, there is significant calcification of that ring, as well as MAC in the native annulus. She has no anterior or anterolateral valve anchoring point. That is a uh, relevant point that we'll talk about in more detail. Um, and her anticipated neo-LVOT area is quite large, so there are no leaflet modification uh, techniques that will be required here. So after careful consideration, uh, the decision was to proceed with a TMBR with a 29 millimeter sapien valve. Um, and we will talk a bit more about the various concerns with possible inquiry. Great. Well, this is a very challenging case. Oh, excellent. I was going to ask you precisely about that. How do you and um, how can you reduce the risk of uh, embolization, valve migration or embolization? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Please, Christine, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Jamie's going to talk in depth about that in just a minute. I did want to pause here to just highlight a few features of the sapien valve that we will be implanting in this case. Um, we are going to be using a 29 millimeter S3 ultra valve. This valve has the same uh, taller textured external skirt as the other smaller sizes of ultra valve that we are accustomed to using. It also has been treated uh, with the Resilia treatment that is now standard on all of the surgical aortic valves, the inspirous valves. The um, External skirt is about 40% higher than the previous iteration, uh, which we anticipate will be helpful in terms of getting a good seal and reducing the risk of TBL. As you know, it's often more challenging in the mitral position to attain good coaxiality. And so uh, the presence of the taller skirt will help um, with good contact all the way around the annulus, even if we end up in a final position that may be slightly off axis. The Resilio treatment um, is intended to address the fact that during tissue preservation, which is done with glutaraldehyde, there is cross-linking between aldehyde molecules in the tissue that promotes increased strength and durability. However, this process uh, invariably results in some residual free aldehydes that remain uncross-linked and thus available for binding to calcium in the future, and this is part of the uh, process that leads to valve degeneration. The Resilio treatment uh, results in permanent capping of these residual free aldehyde molecules, and the um, expected result is that it will improve durability over time. It turns out that as the skirt gets long, gets taller, so does the name. So now we're at Sapien 3 Ultra Resilio Valve, which is, which is a very catchy uh, marketing <laughs> term. Um, all right, sorry. Uh, Myra, let's talk a little bit about what to do and um, and implanting techniques. We have a couple more slides, but maybe it's a good opportunity to, um, to engage the panel and, and you guys about um, concerns in, in terms of anchoring and embolization and, and yeah. potential strategies. I was going to ask my co-moderator here, a surgeon, you know, from a surgical perspective, Gaurav, um, do you think we're going the correct route, transcatheter options, is high risk of you know, prior surgeries? And 
Well, I mean, I think the, the team has done their due diligence and they've had multiple surgeons evaluate the patient. So uh, certainly I, I would say that this probably should be surgery first given the, the anatomy that you're dealing with, with a previous partial band that is even probably a little bit flexible. You have a clip in place. So it's, it's not really well suited for a balloon expandable valve. It, it, you know, in a future state when we have transcatheter mitral valve replacement therapies, that are designed for the mitral valve, you know, it, it might be certainly more suitable. Obviously, the, the uh, tier device that's in place makes adds a little bit of challenge, but there are sites that are starting to show you could use, uh, you know, radio frequency technology to, to mobilize uh, that, that device. So I think in a future state, that certainly makes the most sense, um, assuming that the anatomy is suitable, which uh, based on what you showed, it sounds like from the CT, it, it could have been feasible from an outflow track standpoint. But I, given that this is all we have right now, perhaps this is the, the best option. It is, it is, you know, certainly gives us all angst, and we'd love to hear your, your thoughtful strategy about how you think it might anchor. Mm -hmm. So, Jamie, before we talk about the, the risk of embolization and your strategy, you just presented the one-year data on a recent analysis from the uh, TBT registry for valvin ring. Can you just tell for the audience a few words about which rings would you consider more favorable for transeptal valvin ring? Because so far, what we see here, this is not the most ideal right. ring for that <laughs> procedure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I agree. And maybe, uh, Christine, why don't you, why don't you, I, you know, broadly speaking, I think um, there are, is a effort to sort of collate. Uh, a list of, you know, the, the number of rings is pretty bountiful out there. Mm -hmm. And so there is an effort to collate sort of ring characteristics and ascribe them into sort of a matrix. And maybe, Christine, uh, you want to? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are two broad features of rings um, that are relevant, particularly when considering candidacy for valve and ring. Um, there's the degree of cl completeness. So there are complete, incomplete, and then sort of mostly complete rings. Um, and then the second feature is their uh, rigidity. So there are flexible rings, semi-rigid rings, and then completely rigid rings. In terms of the rings that are sort of ideal for use as an anchoring mechanism for TMBR, um, the semi-rigid complete rings are the best um, because they are able to uh, have the stiffness to anchor, but at the same time, they are flexible enough to assume the, the circular shape of the balloon expandable valve. When you're dealing with a rigid ring, um, the transcatheter valve will not be able to fully expand, and you'll also end up with gullies on either side um, of the valve where there will be significant risk of PVL. Um, and then when you're dealing with incomplete and flexible rings, you really worry about the lack of anchoring um, because you know they, they just aren't stiff enough. Thank so you in much. terms of our ring, um, you know we don't know for sure, but it does seem uh, to be a sort of 180 incomplete um, flexible ring. Um, however, because it's been in for so long, there is quite a bit of calcium that's built up there. And so it's not quite the same as sort of dealing with a fresh flexible ring. We do anticipate that it's gonna provide some um, anchoring in that posterior position. Thank you. In the presence of a prior mitral clip, does that worry you or, or Dr. Webb, any comments on that side of the panel? Any concerns about the presence of a clip? Joao, you're looking at well, me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, the other distinction, too, in the, the mislabeling maybe that we need to also make is the band and rings, right? So that looks almost like a band. It is, it is a band. And a band, it's a band. It's and, a band. Uh, and, you know, there are bands and rings, and rings that are called bands and bands that are called rings. And, uh, you know, the most favorable would be if you, are, if you are incomplete would be that kind of closed C that goes all the way to the trigones. This one stops at the intercommissure, mm. and you have a little bit of less because you have that clip on the medial commissure. Um, you know, it worries me a little bit. I'm, I'm being very curious to see how this is going mm. to be mitigated with, obviously, some anterior anchoring you're going to hear about. You know, a phenomenal case. You know, this reminds me of a case at London Live a few years ago with uh, Maizano uh, as an observer. He was a commenter. And it was actually a very flexible band, more flexible on this. So yeah. there is some rigidity perhaps in this. I guess we'll see. But I remember at the conclusion of the case, Francesco, who's a very well-known surgeon, said, you know, before the case, I don't think I would have done this valve. But after the, pr after the case, I'm sure I wouldn't have done this valve. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you'd better hope it's not too flexible. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Baron, I, does the I presence of a clip make you happy you, or? Does it worry you? Well, it, it, it might actually help. Yeah. 
here. Yeah, yeah. I think in this point, we're, what we're actually looking at is it may provide somewhat of an anchoring mechanism, assuming that it doesn't flick off, which, you know, given that it's been in for a while, I would assume that you're not going to have leaflet detachment. So hopefully that will actually help you a little bit. Yeah, I'm yeah I would not expect leaflet detachment. Actually, it might help because the, the yep. area that they showed was over 700. That's the entire mitral annulus. I'm curious if you have an idea what the mitral valve areas in the orifice that you're you're targeting, which is certainly going to be less and probably more favorable for, for a balloon expandable. Yeah, well, um, I do want to get um, Dr. Mackinson on the TE to give you some pictures, but maybe we'll just, um, I think your concerns are all uh, exactly right, and they're ones that we shared. Um, I was, uh, you know, this is, this is, um, this is real life, and real life is not always pretty, but it is a challenging one. So maybe we can pull the slides back up, and um, and we'll talk a little bit about what I was thinking about. Jamie, a quick question, um, Didi yeah. here. Were yeah. you planning on um, putting anything in the aortic valve to anchor, like a taver valve, to give you kind of an anterior metal frame to abut against? You know, Didi, if you're going to bury the lead, um, you could at least um, give me a little warning. Just kidding. <laughs> yes, we are. We let's get to that. Uh, I want to show you some pretty pictures first, though. Um, so I think everyone recognizes that. Um, I think everyone recognizes that you, you know, to to really anchor well, you want to have sort of either three or four points of friction um, to hold the valve in place. And what we're clearly lacking is anterior lateral um, <clears throat> rigidity in the system. Mm -hmm. Now. It, it does turn out that um, beyond the CT evaluation, the TEE does demonstrate um, some fibrosis that we're going to show you. But uh, but let's move to the next slide for a sec. We we have had some experience with acutely placing mitra clips in MAC, um, and then you know in the same procedure, moving on to put in uh, a transcatheter mitral valve. We call it anchor because that's really clever. And um, this is a scenario that. Um, that we've done, we've done five of these. It's a scenario that we've done uh, for intercommissural distances of like say 36 to 42 kind of range, where the AP dimension is reasonable uh, for anchoring in that uh, axis. And um, that's worked nicely actually with none of the clips do not dislodge. Um, so I don't have any concerns about the current clip that's a year old. Um, and uh, we didn't place it, but uh, it looks like it's in there totally fine and it's fibrous. But it did make me wonder if there was the possibility that we could um, place a lateral clip as a mechanism to kind of get into that corner and create some rigidity. Uh, that said, I was a little concerned that um, with an intercommissural distance of only 22, 23 from the clip to the ring, that did seem pretty tight to put another clip in. So. We actually turned to our friends at DASI Simulations. You can turn to the next slide, please. And they were, this is all, you know, speculative, but they modeled some of this for us. So they put another clip in, you can see it in yellow uh, underneath the valve, and then modeled kind of what would happen to the to the leaf, anterior leaflet and so forth. And, and basically what it came back was that um, the, the, the tension on the anterior mitral leaflet sort of defied the parameters of their modeling um, and was so taut um, that it, you know, they had to sort of make accommodations. And, and I think that fits with my own feelings about this case that putting a lateral clip in, um, it looks pretty here, but I, I think that it would be at high risk for popping off, particularly the anterior mitral leaflet. Um, I don't think that's gonna do what we need. So uh, we then turn to the to, to Didi's idea of, well, what can we do with the aortic valve to help us. And so we can move on to the next slide, please. And, um, you know, she does not have aortic stenosis. She does not really have any calcium. She has some in the, you know, her aorta is calcified. The SCJ is a little calcified. The sinuses have a couple spicules or a couple of dots of calcium. But by and large, um, it's a pretty calcium-free aortic valve with normal function. Um, that said, the the average diameter is 20.5, so there is the opportunity to oversize. Um, and so we um, we asked Stasi to model these as well, and so we can go to the next slide. And first we modeled a 26 Evolute um, in there, just to see how they might interact. Uh, one notable feature about her CT scan is that her LVOT length is actually relatively long, um, which isn't 
in our favor in this case. It's about 12 millimeters from the basal uh, aortic plane to the mitral annulus. But uh, 26 looks like it could do okay. I just was worried about the radial force there and, and whether or not that really is uh, adding anything. Um, she's also 68 and presuming that everything goes swimmingly, um, it would be in there kind of tight and we might be dealing with that down the road. Um, that, that's perhaps a secondary concern, but I just is thinking out loud because um, she does have coronary disease. So then we switched to a 23S3 and we can go to the next slide and modeled that. And what you can see here is that, you know, with a deeper deployment of the S3, we can get them, we can get the valves kind of in proximity to one another. That's a 23 millimeter S3 um, deployed just a, not, deployed at 80-20 in the simulation, I believe. I'm not positive about that. And, um, and they get pretty close to one another. Um, and I did think that if we can extend that LVOT dimension by you know one or two millimeters uh, towards the uh, mitral curtain, um, that that would be helpful. So that is ultimately our plan. And we can go to the next slide. So here it is. We're 23 Sapien, Taver first. We felt like uh, putting a Taver in a completely normal valve uh, was too boring for TCT, so we did that already, and that's fine. I'll show it to you in a sec. Uh, 29 uh, Ultra Resilia TMVR without lampoon. Plug of the medial orifice, if it's necessary. Um, it, it, uh, it measures out at about two millimeters orifice, so I'm not so sure it is. And then I think it's important just because, you know, I, I'm, I wouldn't show this case if I thought it was going to go badly, but I... It is important to have backup plans. And so our bailout strategies, because she does not have a surgical option, are uh, a second valve in valve uh, for atrial migration. And I think in that scenario, we did look carefully at, I mean, at the outflow track. And because you know, if we had needed lampoon or something, a second valve can be risky. But in this case, it's not. So that will be our first bailout strategy. If we have true embolization, into the left atrium, which is the way that valves should, I mean, as long as we don't place it terribly, that's the way it would fall out. Um, we're gonna try and hold that valve in the left atrium with a balloon. We're gonna do a second transeptal that is sort of more superior posterior, and we're gonna go back to the clip option, and then we'll have a taver valve and a clip, plus the original clip, plus the original band, and try again. Um, and then, then anchor the embolized valve to the septum with an ASD occluder. So easy peasy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, well. um, so that is our plan. Jamie, just I a like quick question. You, those modeling that you showed, that's really, I think, fascinating and potentially helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something, two questions, is that something you utilize really frequently or only on very specific cases? You know, I think, um, I think the mitral stuff is really interesting, but is very, uh, is still, um, is, is not validated per se. I mean, some of the aortic work that they've done appears that they've gotten pre and post CTs. They've gotten a lot of information to sort of feed a machine learning kind of algorithm. Um, I think the mitral space is a little newer. I, I mean, I don't want to speak for the folks at DASI, but, um, but it, it seems like it's a little bit newer and more um, still kind of hypothesis generating, let's say. Um, so we don't use it a ton. We've just kind of started engaging with them because I do think that um, some of this information is super helpful and they have a lot of, um, they have a lot of data on like coronary obstruction risk and so forth that that, that is, um, that can be pretty powerful. Okay, good. Well, I admire your courage and your uh, creative, thoughtful case planning. We can't wait to see, you know, the results. And why, why don't we keep well, going with the case, please? Okay. Rekar, you want to go through some echo images? Absolutely. Great. Um, while he's going back there, I'll just show you, if you can see our flora, I'll show you a couple of quick pictures. Um, apropos to today's uh, data, we did put in a Sentinel device. It, um, you know, data wasn't obviously about mitrals, and we do tend to use it for mitral cases. Um, we're trying to spare contrast, uh, so just establishing coplanar view with a couple of catheters, because her creatinine is three. Um, here is a 23 millimeter sapien deployed purposefully low. Uh, we we're trying to get five to six millimeters in the outflow track, which I think we were successful in doing. 
Um, and, um, and then from there, we've just, you know, we took a quick picture just to sort of demonstrate that. It's five cc's of contrast. Um, and then we, ha we took out the, she's got bad PAD, so we took the, the taver sheath out just so it wasn't occlusive in her leg for a prolonged period. And then we've done our transeptal, and that catches you up to date on where we are. Thank you. Um, Burkhart, take it away. All right, can we have uh, echo only? Thank you. So I'm going to start showing you just a number of images from the case that I took at baseline. As you know, we always take a comprehensive baseline at every single structural heart case. And by the way, my hat that you probably saw today is uh, to recognize the big the, um, the importance of the imager in these cases, and for all of you to appreciate your imagers, um, I'm certainly a member and quite involved with the American Society of Echocardiography. I know our president, Steve Little, is there at TCT, so try to uh, find him and talk with him about the importance of the imager on the heart valve team. <laughs> I'm going to move on and show you the mitral regurge. As said before, even though the transthoracic echo red at times may be moderate, it's clearly a severe degree of um, uh, MR. Uh, the rate is here, so actually uh, it jumps up to a effective regurgitation in orifice of 0.45, certainly in the severe category. And we found significant uh, flow reversal, at least in the left upper pulmonary vein. Here's an on-fast view, and as you may remember, some of the 3D images you saw up front in the presentation looked like there were no leaflets, and I think it's really important to use the 3D appropriately and, and look into the 3D gain and also question are we actually undergaining, and I can quickly make the valve look much bigger if I just undergain like this, and all of a sudden we're looking at a very different orifice. So it's really a careful uh, adjustment of the gain, if that makes sense. I'm gonna show you a few images here from top and from ventricular. And in terms of the discussion we had about anchoring, I think it's really important to look at the ventricular side. If I may point out, looking at the ventricular side with the aortic valve now up on top, this was actually before the tower came into the aortic position, you see pretty significant calcification of the uh, subvalvular apparatus, including the tips of the papillary muscle and the chordal apparatus. So I think uh, that's an important feature here. If I show this more dynamically and rotate the valve and kind of highlight it against the aortic position, which is back here, you may appreciate how significant these anterior structures are. And I think to some degree, they could help in anchoring this valve. Now looking with a different view, that's a glass view. Not always sure how much this helps, but it certainly uh, indicates the, um, the clip and then also the relatively small orifice. Again, question of gain here as well. This is again that calcific change in the subvalvular apparatus. Now looking at the MR, here is a 3D on fast. If I go to the original one, I can quickly uh, rotate the image. Often if we have severe MR, it's just too much and we don't actually see it. So I like to then put in a wall filter and quickly uh, at least appreciate the directionality of the flow even though that may not lend itself to quantify the severity any longer, but it helps for cleaning up the image so we actually show which way this goes. Clearly a posterior jet uh, in this case. Uh, not much of a gradient at this point. Uh, we also looked at uh, diastolic function, um, and then we got to the Tava. Maybe I show you just a couple images of the deployed Tava valve. And so now what's of interest and in context of the discussion around the potential anchor anteriorly with the potential interaction between the tower valve and then the, uh, the new valve in valve for the mitral, we certainly have appreciated, this is the medial commissure where you see the clip, 
we've certainly seen that this power valve came down quite ni nicely. And if I look at the 3D on FAT, actually take this one, there's a significant imprint, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, that, that you see here. That's the, that's the very distal LVOT or LV pointing um, aspect of the tower valve right at the aortomitral curtain. So I think we've certainly um, had it ventricular enough in order to see. If we quickly wanna appreciate that position one more time, I can take in a cropping plane and bring it in from the side and then we create a long axis view. It just takes one <coughs> second coming in and now I'm gonna rotate that image. So here you have even an indication of the leaflets right here and then the very distal tip of the tava valve now sitting <coughs> very close to the, uh, what is the anterolateral uh, chordal structure with the calcific changes. Can you guys help uh, uh, the audience understand how much lower that is relative to the, the uh, aortic, the TAVR relative to the aortic annulus? <laughs> yeah, so we measure that out at about six or seven millimeters from where used to be the aortic valve annulus down and into the LVOT, if you will. So it's sort of like a 70-30 kind of deployment as opposed to kind of more contemporary 90-10 or yeah. whatnot. And any, any impact on the conduction system? Thus far? Well, the, the pacemaker continues to work fine. Okay. That's what they think. Fair okay, enough. why don't we yeah, see she the... Came, she came with one uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, yeah. There was a question about the mitral valve orifice. Uh, based on our assessment, about 2.4, 2.5 centimeters squared. Also wanted to highlight just briefly, looking at other valves, uh, that this patient seems to have pretty significant uh, TR, if not severe. It has certainly a holosystolic flow reversal as you may appreciate here. So uh, just uh, an expression also in context of a PA pressure that at times reaches 70 over 33 as we are looking at uh, real time numbers. Sorry, Burkhardt, I, I think, I think we need Once to move on with the, the case. Uh, can you show us yep. what you have done so far in terms of the um, valve implantation? Or let's just We've move forward nothing. with that. We were waiting for you. No, let's um, move forward with that. So here we go, we're, just a, we're across the valve. Let's take the sentinel, I mean, not the sentinel, but the torpedo. Um, all right. We were stalling for as long as we could, so we didn't have to do the valve implant, <laughs> um, obviously. Um, so we're just basically going to do a balloon septostomy here, and then um, bring the valve in. Uh, keep the wire in there. Myra, this is very novel. What are your thoughts about PVL risks and uh, in this situation, and what would you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was not as concerned about the PVL risk um, as I am about the risk of embolization. I was thinking in my mind, um, with the new dedicated transcatheter mitral valves, which have an anchoring yeah. mechanism, I wondered if an off-label use of those devices, or mm -hmm. perhaps uh, in a different country yeah. where there's a device approved, you know, that could have perhaps been a safer alternative as opposed yeah. to taking our chances right. here. I mean, I trust that they, they have a great team and they have very, very carefully planned yeah. plan A, B, and C in all the stages. Yeah. So I think it's going to go well, but uh, perhaps a transcatheter might have a device with an anchor mechanism, yeah. maybe I a mean, better option. The, the medial clip obviously makes M3 um, kind of a no-no unless we were to cut it off perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, but even then, I think it would be pretty challenging. Um, you know, Intrepid w could be um, a thought. Um, unfortunately, her sort of decompensation really got in the way of um, any sort of exploration of compassionate use. Um, you can try there. Um, as you know, compassionate use does take a little while. Uh, as you know, compassionate use does take a bit of time, so. Um, yeah, and, and to go, going back to Didi's question, um, Dr. Wang's question, uh, about paravalvular leak, the, yes, even yeah. though it may happen, it gives you time, you know, and you can deal with that uh, either during the index procedure or later Balloon on. Balloon looks good. Yeah. But the uh, embolization does not give you much time. Um, I'm more worried about that. Yeah. Jamie, you're obviously a very experienced implanter. It's not the first time that you're doing this. Can you share with us your experience? Um, did there ever a need to do a uh, kissing balloon, like a, in the aortic, since it's TAVR, yeah. it, there's no calcium there and everything, while you're doing the mitral, or what's your experience and what have you guys learned uh, to share with us? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that having the, I, I don't know, is the answer. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think we got it there on Echo. It's very dilute. Um, I don't know, but I think that, um, I think having the two valves at different uh, annular planes with the aortic valve being so much higher um, probably is going to be a benefit. Um, probably is going to be a benefit. Hold on one second, Gabriel. Let's just aspirate this a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, push that forward. Mm -hmm. uh, um, probably is going to help not deform the TAVR valve, but we shall see. And that way it may be beneficial that it's a balloon expandable TAVR valve as opposed to self expanding. Yeah, to provide more anchoring. Mm -hmm. Theoretically. Yeah, I think you're un unlikely to uh, to deform it. It's right. more the concern would you dislodge it or move it. It it's pretty pretty rigid valve, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Particularly but in a probably non not. landing zone. If you add extra volume on the 29, um, oh, yeah. in three, and, yeah. and how much? We're going to do four, mm -hmm. um, which in this case is the magic number. Mm -hmm. And if you need to get more than that, uh, would you add more volume? Would you pulse dilate with the same balloon at adding uh, more volume, or do you switch to a different balloon? I generally like to pulse dilate with the same balloon. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I think once you get past four, I'm not sure if there is a lot of merit to to more. I mean, the balloon can only hold so much, but mm -hmm. um, we'll probably just hit it again with four mm -hmm. if it if things look okay. Mm -hmm. And I usually just push it in a little more ventricular um, to uh, just yeah. kind of try and get that mm -hmm. flower upside down flower pot look. The other factor that may increase the risk of embolization is the mode of failure, right? The pathology underneath is mostly primarily mitral regurgitation. So in, in some cases, you're dealing with uh, some stenosis and calcification and rigid uh, tissue. Better about and then you feel better yeah. about that, yeah. that it may uh, provide a little bit of anchoring. So here, that's not the case. Watch it's mostly water. MR. So I would definitely put more volume, just like they're doing, perhaps even more than four. It may go up to 10 if needed. Okay. So I'm curious, um, Myra, what's your thoughts on wh what's the ideal landing position? You know, I know yep. you've thought a lot about this, and, and then I'd love to hear Jamie weigh in after that. Yeah. I would say as ventricular as possible, 80-20 uh, or 90-10. Mm. Uh, with the uh, prior version of the Sapien 3, you would also worry about the coverage of the skirt across yeah. the annulus. So you also need to be lower because of that. Here, the, the skirt is taller, so... But still, if, if there's going the to be migration or immobilization, it would most likely go to the atrium. Yeah. So the more ventricular you are, the better position you will be. Plus, in this case, there's no risk of LDOT obstruction, or I would say that would be very low. So you have no yeah. concerns about being yeah. too ventricular. So I would say as ventricular as possible. Right. So Jamie, give us a beat for the audience. Tell, tell them uh, what wire you have across, and then what's your thought process of position of this valve in the annulus, so in the mitral annulus? Yeah, um, I am. I like the confida or confida, or however you say it. Um, it's kind of my wire of choice. I think the tip is a little bit softer and more forgiving. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is shorter than a safari, so if you have long delivery system cases, that it doesn't work as well. But um, but that's my preference. It's just a preference thing. Um, and then um, we have a big sheath in, a, a dry seal, just so that it wasn't going to sort of drip uh, at the valve while we had our steerable catheter in. Um, and now, as you can see, the valve's across. Um, we're not very well coaxial at the moment. We're, I'm doing, I like to do kind of a push-push where I push the wire and I push the valve and I try and get it to sort of stand up on the lateral margin of the valve. Um, in this case, it's a little more challenging because that's not where the um, calcification is, so it's a little bit harder to see exactly where to be. Mm -hmm. We can also try going a little posterior. Um, yeah. In addition, the, the balloon um, or the stent is not centered on the marker. Something to It is not. That is true. Something to um, consider during deployment. And, and yeah. I was going to mention there's no landing zone. I can appreciate the challenges. Um, 
position in yeah. this valve because you don't have a radio peak marker no, on the ventricular side of the yeah. of the yeah. ring. We have a we have the clip, so the clip we know is just below the annulus, obviously, but that's mm -hmm. we're not adjacent to the clip, so we're going to have to just project mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, and and it, you know I don't think that if we put more flexion, my cat my um, steerable catheter is straight, but if I put more flexion on it. Um, try and kind of torque it and so forth. I'm just not sure that I like that. So I think I'm just going to go with straight again. I like to straighten it out and then push everything lateral. That's mm -hmm. generally my move. And I feel like you can kind of go in and out based on how much you push the catheter and how much you push the yeah. wire, right? So the wire for pushes for you the atrial, audience, the um, sometimes you can do an LD gram to look at the annulus uh, or to yep. get a better idea. I know that this patient has a renal failure and you wanted to minimize the amount of contrast. But I just wanted yeah. to mention that sometimes if you want to confirm you know, that, yeah. may be, that may be helpful, but... Yeah, that's but true. Well, but no, you, why sure don't you continue? Yeah, I don't want, we don't want to... Here, here we go. We don't want um, to call can you. Can you just set that for 10 for 10? We'll do a, we'll do a wimpy little LV gram. Nothing, nothing serious, but she can handle. We've used seven cc's of contrast so far, so she can handle a little bit more. Jamie, uh, is there a specific you, you type help? of uh, G4 clip that you like to use uh, based on thickness or calcium or... And I use anything? the NTWs. I mean, you're in the commissure, so you don't want to be long. Um, ready for a synage? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I like just uh, taking up the width. I'm not sure that helped us a ton, but I think we're just going to have to yeah. mm -hmm. settle in. And sort of and seems like a line between the, yeah. the calcium posteriorly and the, the lower ridge of the tabbers. Yeah. I think it may be a little atrial. That's my bias. You know, I would probably push yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, the NPR suggests just light atrial. Mm -hmm. I would go yeah. more ventricular, yeah. And, and your II right now, is it just AP, or did you uh, No, it's use 32 uh, RAO. It's always kind of some RAO yeah. projection. Um, all right, it's time to go catch a cannonball. Can that, we... That looks um, better. We're going um, to... We're going to suspend pacing... Uh, excuse me. We're going to suspend respirations, okay? And then once you hear the sine come off, you can just breathe her, uh, in case I forget to tell you. We're going to pace at 200, okay? And uh, and then just the slow deployment. You good? Okay. Uh, suspend respirations, please. Okay, pacer on. Oh yeah, we had this problem earlier. Go to 120 and then walk it up. Okay. Okay, walk it up. And you can walk it up quickly here. Uh -huh. Keep walking up. You can start to go up there, Gabriel. Okay, good. Yeah, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep going. Mm. Oh, and stop. Stop pacing. Off pacer and breathe. We're a little more ventricular than I would like. I like that. I think we're going to need a second valve. But let's see. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to pull the balloon back here. Let's look at PEE. Hanging on. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Did you it's have got some a nice flower pot. Yeah. Did you have some trouble like inflating that. that balloon? A little bit, yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes we found that if you do too much of this throttling, you can actually compress the inflation deflation lumen. I've seen twice where people have had trouble oh, inflating or deflating tough. after throttling aggressively. I, d I don't know. It didn't look like you did it too aggressively, though. Mm -hmm. in, in Is that all just wire? It doesn't look like it's moving there. I thought I was too deep, but no. maybe we were mm -hmm. no, I don't think no. exactly where I intended I for it to be. Good. I think it's good, and yeah. I think that's what we need. Uh, and you okay. see the uh, anterior chordal apparatus again as an extension yep. yeah. right here. Okay, let's walk this out, and we'll get a pigtail in and get mm -hmm. the stiff wire out between these two columns of calcific cords as well. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like maybe you got away with it. Yeah. yeah. So one of the most you know, common reasons that is, for um, I feel like that's, uh, I feel like you're, you're trying to say something there, John. I, um, we, we nailed it. That's how we think of it. Yes. <laughs> no, and yeah, I was just going to say that one of the most common reasons for need for second valve is actually being more atrial. We end up being more yeah. atrial than we think. So I think mm -hmm. uh, you know this would have been the case probably if we, you had not gone more ventricular. So you want to be as ventricular as you can, Beautiful. and you nailed yeah, it just like you said. No, the I hard think part it looks, with these is always superb. that when you're doing Excellent. the deployment, it, it the whole thing shifts, and then you're not coaxial, and you're like, I can't tell which side is the deep side and which side is. I mean, if we watch this again, 
it is uh, sorry, and then I screwed that up. Um, yeah, it's just okay. until you until you reset it in a coaxial view and, and square it off, it can be really hard to tell what's what's what. Um, anyway, you get the idea. I'm sorry, that's um, there you go. Pull that out. I think there's actually evidence for an interaction of the uh, Tava valve in the aortic position and the valve and valve right here at this point. This is what's the ceiling? Yeah. So this is going to be AO, oh, excuse me, it's going to be um, LVLA. I mean, you guys have a great technique there. It looks like the Tava valve definitely helped anchor the TMVR. Um, is Burkhardt, is the Tavra valve functioning okay? Yeah, that's working fine, and it's still working fine. It Here's looks, so looks this great. Is, this is our outflow track, which it's has no gradient. I'm going to shed some light on it in and a then second. I'll, I'll pull back here in just a sec. A bit uh, of yeah. um, all right, and here Certainly don't appreciate any PVL. Okay, mm -hmm. we're, we're not across the uh, valve any longer. Looking at the aortic tower valve now. Usually it's an L caudal mm -hmm. that'll give you a kind Certainly of Certainly didn't have any LVOT issues before, and even now the flow looks laminar. So I don't anticipate to have an increased gradient at all. Looked like when you deployed initially, um, your II wasn't didn't show that the, the new ultra was uh, a little bit off axis. Yeah. Okay. That's and right. and um, I guess how much do you try to perfect that? You know, even just in valve and valve in general. Um, well, because you didn't really know where the anus was in either. So. Yeah, my experience, um, besides it always being terrifying, is that it always sort of does this, which is that you're you're squared off to the calcium as far as you can gather, but then once the valve goes in, the whole thing reorients a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I've never not had that happen, as opposed to Taver, where I feel like you can get your great your angle and deploy, and it stays squared off. Um, we're just always a little canted, um, and so I've never. And you know, in this view, you can see that the side that looks like it's kind of close until we until I moved it, the side that uh, kind of visually looks like it's closer to us looks like it's nicely atrial, but I wasn't so sure about that sort of what I interpret as sort of the far side of the frame because it looked like it was down at the mm. level of the calcium a little bit more. And that's the whole challenge with these is just trying to, er, in my mind. So, so it's interesting in the LAO up the barrel that there, there isn't any direct contact between those two valves. Yeah. And, and yet I yeah. wonder if there's soft tissue, you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's supported giving you some. I was thinking the same, of, or perhaps yeah. it's not adding any support and all the credit should go to the previously placed mitral clip. Yeah, it's the inch <laughs> part of the inch release uh -huh. yeah. annuals. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I yeah. think it, you know, that whole AV curtain, if you, you, know, held if you put place. it under tension, yeah. Yeah. It, it is uh, it, that, I don't know. We're all just guessing. But, uh -huh. um, but I'm going to give it credit because otherwise I gave her a tower valve she didn't need. <laughs> so it clearly is helpful. Um, I think everybody would agree with that uh, if robustly. Oh, I, 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 I'd give it all. I give your, yourself all the credit. Yes, That's just yes. wonderful. No, yeah, definitely. I really admired your courage. Like I said earlier, uh, do you already already show the 3D color on uh, DEE? I'm sorry, oh my, yeah. screen, my screen screen yes, for did. a moment. Yeah. You did. And yeah. there was no we did. I show it again, but I'm just doing the uh, mm -hmm. um, homework at the bottom. Yeah, there's, so there's a gradient of 10 over 5 through the aortic valve. Okay, and then just and the LVOT has no gradient also either. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do one more live image of the Marshall 3D with color. Mm -hmm. So and there's a 90-10 implantation there on the EE. That's how it, yeah. that's what it shows. That's perfect. Here's the color. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's outstanding. <laughs> yeah. That really was great. Outstanding. My, my respect to you guys. It is interesting the anterior uh, side of that, the new mitral valve is a little bit crimped. So you wonder, as John suggested what is it really being crimped against i mean what's what's providing that is it previous fibrosis is it uh, an impact from the tavern but you could see that at the very top 
like a little under expanded on the inflow on the atrial side of yeah, the stent. Yeah, yeah. So yep. now, yeah, given that, Jamie, I mean, you initially said you you usually reballoon it. What's your thought on that now? I'm not going to here. I mean, no. we've got a nice mm -hmm. flower pot. Mm -hmm. I agree. We, um, okay. I I feel very yeah. comfortable with where this is at. There's no. I think suggestion of mm -hmm. movement. Um, and and so part I, of I that is the overexpansion on the ventricular side of the stem yeah. frame yeah. by yeah. adding the extra that's volume. Fair. So that's yeah. what yeah. Uh, that's what adding extra volume does for you. Yeah. It almost it, it shapes us um, as if you had done post dilatation, but without having to do a post dilatation. So. Um, yeah. And that would help with migration. And, and for everybody in the audience, don't try this at home. I was right. going to say the same. Yeah. <laughs> don't try this at home. What? I think we need to wrap up this case. I would case. like to give a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, a big congratulations, congratulations to the team, guys. Congratulations guys. This Great is job. impressive. My respect, guys. Really awesome. Awesome Thank case. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, wow. Let us know how the patient did next year, how, how good they <laughs> feel. I hope yeah. we hope they feel fantastic yeah, now. We told her she was going to have to run home, actually. Um, Same day so discharge. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, this guys. Awake, right? I'll All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Congratulations. Thank you, Washington. Yeah. Okay. All right.